Those who in Germany in the post-war years considerably increased their own fortunes, or who became new possessors of huge fortunes, were mainly those men who understood before others the phenomenon of the inflation, and who, foreseeing the continual depreciation of the German currency, used this knowledge in all their financial operations. The Economics of Inflation A Study of Currency Depreciation in Post-War Germany by Constantino Taroni, 1931. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in. This is Christopher Aaron. This is November 15th. It's a few hours after our normal broadcast time. It is the morning of the 15th, and I'm glad you're here. We're going to talk about this topic of the economics of inflation. And if anyone is interested, this book by Constantino Taroni, which is an extensive documentation of the hyperinflation in Germany, in the Weimar Republic, after World War I, he's talking about. So it's a prescient time for that, just having celebrated the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I last week. Um, this study is one of the best studies there is on the topic, and there are a few lessons that I want to bring to you from my study of this book that apply to our situation in the precious metals and what we're seeing happening in front of our eyes and what could happen as the inflation that we're experiencing gets worse over the years ahead. Let's dive right in. We look at gold and silver over the last few days to begin. We are seeing a little bit of a bounce here in gold. We had a support level here that went out to premium subscribers last week at 1197. So see how that bounced right there. That was in print. Um, so the levels that we look at here are not completely random and they're not all entirely controlled by manipulation. There is the opportunity to trade and to time purchases sometimes better than other times. So we are seeing the bounce here in gold. And then when we switch over to look at silver, we continue to see the underperformance in silver. Unfortunately, we're in one of those situations where over the short run, we have some higher targets for gold, but silver looks like it's going to diverge from gold. We had a video about this two weeks ago, and we we're talking about seeing that breakdown in silver give us a little fake out for one day. It bounced back up about 60 cents the day after the video two weeks ago, and then gave all those gains back and then just made a new low today. So this is the weakness that I was anticipating minus any sort of little bounce here over the next several days we will be looking at lower prices especially for silver over the weeks and months ahead let us talk about this period we're talking about the economics of inflation from this incredible book that gives so much details there's so much data in there um, and this is just one of the most important aspects of it that i wanted to bring to your attention so we're referring to this period here uh, this is from page 39 of the book. This is a little snippet of it. And we're referring to especially this chart here. And this is the graph of the hyperinflation after World War I. Of course, we're talking about the period after the Treaty of Versailles uh, when Germany was faced with all these war reparations. They were unable to pay them off. And so they did as many governments do when they overextend themselves, which is to ramp up the printing press. Now, most governments do that today, except they just do it by uh, typing doot, 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 a few keystrokes on the keyboard. But back then, they literally printed the currency and used that to try to pay off their war debts. Now, we could have arguments for as long as we want about whether or not the war debts were uh, appropriate, but the bottom line is they chose that route. And the result here. What we're looking at is from 1914 through 1923, the value of one gold mark, one German gold mark in terms of paper marks. So another way you can think about that is we can imagine uh, dollars per ounce of gold. That would be the modern equivalent. We're talking about the value of gold marks in terms of paper marks. And you can see this started at one to one. So one piece of paper was worth one gold mark. And by the end of the hyperinflation, we are talking that that same uh, gold mark was worth one trillion paper marks. Okay, so this is what a hyperinflation results in. So we're talking the opposite would be the value of the currency. This is the price 
of gold as expressed in paper during hyperinflation. Now, there's this little period in here. Of course, this is the famous picture that we often see of the girl burning the German marks as kindling because the value of the marks was more uh, was worth more for the heat element of the paper than the actual printed face value. So they used it as kindling. There's all these other examples of ways that the German marks were used during the hyperinflation. Now, I want to zoom in on this little piece of history here, though, that is often overlooked, this period between mid-1919 and early 1921. I want to zoom this in because it's very easy to just look at this and say, oh, right, so when there's inflation, when governments try to print their way out of something, all you need to do is buy gold and then the price will skyrocket or the price will continue to move higher year after year after year. But if we actually zoom in on this window here, we're going to notice an interesting thing here. So here's that zoom in. Now, this is all chronicled. This is all indexed to a 100 level on the Y axis here. OK, and we're looking at a few different categories. We're looking at the amount of floating debt that Germany issued in this red window. So we're looking they doubled the amount of debt that they issued right from an index of 100 to 200. They doubled the amount of debt. Um, the amount of currency in circulation rose by almost 50 percent. That's right here. Cost of food rising a little bit less by 40 percent. Domestic prices staying even. Uh, but now look at something very, very strange. So remember, as they are doubling their debt and a 50% increase in 18 months in the amount of currency, look at what happened to the price of gold. We have the debt increasing. And in this period of time, we have gold down by 60%, 60% in just over four months. Can you imagine that? So you're, you're here, you know, in the Weimar Republic, you're watching this, you're watching your food prices go higher week after week, rent prices going higher, you're watching the government issue all this debt, yet the value of gold drops. Now imagine we're talking about um, prices near where they are right now. We're talking about $1,200 gold. This would be like uh, gold falling down to close to $500 an ounce from 1200 Can you imagine that? You'd be thinking, wow, something is really wrong with my thinking or, you know, there's something crazy going on or maybe it's manipulation or who knows what's happening. Right. And we can see even 18 months later, the price of gold still had not caught up to where the floating debt was at that time. Of course, here they're calling this the dollar exchange. But what is it? the dollar exchange for the German marks. And of course, the dollar being backed by this very specific gold coin that was issued in the 1920s, just under one ounce of gold here. OK, so we see how sometimes there can be these deflationary periods for gold itself, where gold can lose value, even though all of the fun fundamentals are suggesting that gold should be gaining in value. So I wanted to bring this to your attention. Let's let's zoom that back out. And we can see here how insignificant that looks over the grand scheme of things. Um, yet to individuals who were just beginning to pick up on the trend, let's say in 1919, as they're watching prices rise, and then they're thinking, OK, wow, I got it. I, I'm protecting myself. Boom, the floor drops out from underneath them, 60% down. And they didn't recover for another year and a half, mind you. So I'm just saying to imagine how this would have impacted you psychologically. And I think we have to remember that even in the worst of inflationary periods, and let's hope things do not get this bad in the United States or in any of the other countries around the world. Um, it's certainly approaching that in Venezuela right now. And Argentina is getting pretty bad as it stands. But let's hope that it doesn't spread beyond those countries. But can we imagine that this happens even during an overall hyperinflationary period. There's some other interesting facets of a hyperinflation. I think there's a tendency in the precious metals world here to say, you know, there's there's inflation, there's increased debt, uh, there's maybe a stock market bubble. All these things are unsustainable, uh, unwinnable wars, everything that we know to be true fundamentally. 
yet it's easy to fall into the camp of thinking that those are the only things that are happening, that there's only bad things happening in the world because of hyperinflation is going on. So let's look again at what happened during Germany uh, during the late 1910s and early 1920s. Of course, there were bad things happening. You know, we looked at this example before. Um, children receiving soup from a, from a food line. This is horrible. Uh, a woman scooping up tossed out vegetables out of the street that were tossed out by, uh, by a, a passing car. You know, this is horrible, of course. Many, many horrible things, yes, happening during a hyperinflation. However, was everything happening in Germany in the late 1910s and early 1920s bad? Let's look at a few other things that people, I think, miss sometimes that were happening simultaneously. Number one, this guy, Mr. Einstein, receiving the Nobel Prize for his work while he was based in Germany in 1921 for physics. Um, one of the most famous books published by Carl Jung was released in 1921, this uh, psychology, uh, psycho psychological types, I believe is the correct translation, uh, released in 1921, in the midst of the hyperinflation, some brilliant thinking going on in several different realms. Cinema, it's very interesting. German cinema at this time in the early 1920s is considered by art scholars to have been more advanced than American cinema. They were more advanced than Hollywood. German cinema, they were some of the first um, productions to incorporate sound into their movies in the early 1920s. When we were still watching uh, soundless movies here in the United States, they were well beyond us in Germany in the midst of the hyperinflation. Auto racing, premier world auto racing going on in the sport realm based on the technological innovations. And if you're not into autos, but you're into motorcycles like me, the founding of BMW and the very first BMW motorcycle coming out in 1923. Literally, as individuals are stuffing bills into the furnace, BMW comes out with their classic motorcycle, which is still the basis for the R series that they release to this day. So we're almost at 100 years of the anniversary of this. Hyperinflation produced during that time. What else? The German uh, Art Institute here, the Bauhaus, if I'm pronouncing that correct. This is an art institute that still exists to this day. This was founded in 1919. So in some, I mean, and what else? You know, children finding a way to have some fun, right? Playing with the stacks of bills uh, with their dog, right? So yes, there were horrible things going on, but there was also... Uh, massive improvements happening in technology, in art, in science, and in philosophy. Now, let's not forget the most important negative thing that came out of this period, just to balance out the scale once again. Gentlemen right here. Of course, Adolf Hitler gaining power in the early 1920s partially coming to power as a result of what he observed, seizing on the hyperinflation as an opportunity uh, to grab control of the, of the public psyche uh, and rising to power, even though in the early 1920s, um, the Nazi vote was still in the low single digit percentages, but certainly the period here led to the rise of Hitler. So, the point that I'm trying to make here is that even during a hyperinflation, there are many horrible things that happen to individuals and to a country. And simultaneously, there are many amazing things that happen and can happen. It's not one or the other. And I think there's this tendency here in the precious metals world to act like everything is all doom and gloom, like everything is going to hell in a handbasket, and nothing good can come out of this period in front of us. And I want to challenge you right now to start to think about the world in a different way, that these things can be happening, and we do need to protect ourselves, but amazing things can happen at the same time. Innovations can happen at the same time. This is the challenge in front of us, to not toss the baby out with the bathwater. 
If you like these types of videos, please hit the subscribe button, that red button below the video. That will keep you up to date on when new videos are released. I do want to say thank you very much to all the patrons on Patreon account for all those who have given donations for the creation of these videos. I very much appreciate it. If you would like to go further into the actual technical analysis, our highest expectations for what is going to happen turn by turn with gold, silver, the mining sector, as well as the US dollar, the stock market, and the bond market, there is a premium service you can sign up for. It includes videos like this and written updates that go out at least once a week, if not more often, right to your inbox. Find more on the homepage. I also work with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis if you would like to speak about your situation from someone who doesn't sell the metals, mind you. In closing, as I said, there is this doom and gloom, and it's very easy to focus on those things when we study, especially the periods through history, and when we study what is happening in the world right now. Very, very easy to fall into this, and it's very easy to sell, but I do not believe that it's accurate. We can see this throughout history. Good things happen at the same time as bad things are happening. What are we going to focus on to the best of our ability? As we are protecting ourselves, as we are navigating these markets, what are we going to focus on with our energy? So I want to challenge you and I want to propose something. And I think as opposed to doom and gloom, I think the direction that I am moving personally, and I hope you will consider moving this direction is more like something doom yet thrive. Let's do that together. I will see you this time next week.